right, Chair Weeks, looks like we have a full house tonight, so I think we are ready to start when you are at 4.30. Great. Thanks, Mike. Um, we'll start right at 4.30, which is in about a minute. If everybody would start putting their cameras on, that would be great. Uh, some reason my camera has been disabled. Maybe you guys are just jealous. <laughs> I, I think we are, Commissioner Holton. <laughs> I think we all wish we were having a meeting there. <laughs> I got to say, this is the best place I've ever had a meeting. There, there, now we see you. Oh, my gosh. Look at that view. Yep. And that's that's the not best fake, place. is it? That's real, but, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Best place for a meeting I can possibly imagine. So that's great. I, I, I was so happy my plane, like I figured it out because the last time we had a commission meeting and I was in Hawaii, I ended up missing it because my plane great. landed late. This time I was like, I'm getting early. <laughs> well, thank you for your dedication. <laughs> thank you. Um, so with that, um, if staff's ready, I think we'll go ahead and start the meeting. Uh, <laughs> So with that, I'd like to call to order the January 27th, 2022 meeting of the Santa Rosa Planning Commission. And before we start, I'll read the statement that I've been reading now for almost a year. Uh, and before that, I think Commissioner, or Commissioner Cisco would, was reading the statement. So uh, due to the provisions of the governor's executive orders N-25-20 and N-29-20, which suspends certain requirements of the Brown Act and the order of the health officer of the County of Sonoma to shelter in place to minimize the spread of COVID-19. The planning commissioners will be conducting today's meeting in a virtual setting using Zoom webinar. Commissioners and staff are participating from remote locations and are practicing appropriate social distancing, some more remote than others. Um, members of the public may view and listen to the meeting as noted on the city's website and as noted on the agenda. Members of the public wishing to speak during item four public comment or during our public hearing tonight will be able to do so by raising their hand and will be given the ability to address the commission. So with that, um, I'd like to call for the roll. Thank you, Chair Weeks. Let the record reflect that all commissioners are present. Thank you. And with that, item two is approval of minutes. Uh, we have one set of minutes from December 9th. Um, do, were there any changes or corrections? Okay, seeing none, um, those then will stand as approved. And then with item three is our public comment period. And <clears throat> I will now open the public comment for any item that is not included in this meeting's agenda. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please select the raise hand button. If you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. And each speaker will have three minutes. A countdown timer will appear for the convenience of the speaker and the viewers. And please make sure to unmute yourself when you're invited to do so. And then your microphone will be muted at the end of the countdown. Mr. Maloney. Do you see, or Ms. Buckite, do you see anybody with hands raised tonight? No one is raising their hands at this time, Charles. Thank you. Okay, and I just, just, okay, they put it back down. <laughs> so this is for the public hearing, this is for comments for items not on the agenda. Okay, so I don't see any raised hands. So with that, I'll go ahead and close the public comment period and we'll move on to commissioner's report and um, I'll read our statement of purpose. The planning commission is charged with carrying out the California planning and zoning laws in the city of Santa Rosa. Duties include implementing of plans, ordinances and policies relating to land use matters, assisting in writing and implementing the general plan and area plans, holding public hearings and acting on proposed changes to the zoning code, zoning map, general plan, tentative subdivision maps and undertaking taking special planning studies as needed. So are there any committee reports from either subdivision or waterways? Uh, Commissioner Carter? 
Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Chair Weeks. Um, this morning, the Waterways Advisory Committee did uh, meet. Uh, we had one project before us. It was a, a proposal for the Hyatt to uh, relocate their security fencing adjacent to the uh, Prince Memorial Parkway. Um, in general, the committee was supportive of the project. There's a real security concern there, but there were reservations about the height of the fence, which is proposed at eight feet and how that might set a dangerous precedent along the um, parkway and needed some clarification about the maintenance of the landscape elements that are on the Hyatt property, but are part of the parkway and therefore were uh, maintained by the city. Um, so we asked for additional information, um, which I assume we'll receive in advance of it going to the zoning administrator for its minor design review. And that's all we had. So Commissioner Carter, is um, zoning administrator then the final step in this? After yes, it you is. See it again? Okay. Uh, I, it wasn't clear to me whether it'll come back to us as a formal item or whether the summary uh, of our concerns uh, that will go to the zoning administrator is what we'll see. Okay. Okay. Great, thank you. Uh, any thank questions you. of Commissioner Carter? Um, and which I don't believe there was a subdivision meeting. Okay, so with that, we'll move um, on to, um, are there any commissioners, is there anything the commission the commissioners would like to report out on at this time? Okay, seeing shaking heads. Uh, we'll go to department reports. So, Ms. Jones? Yes, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Jessica Jones, um, staff liaison and supervising planner. Um, so, yes, I've got a very brief update for you guys. Um, and just quickly to answer the question about the Waterways Advisory Committee meeting item that was just mentioned by Commissioner Carter. Uh, my understanding is that that item will be returning to the Waterways Advisory Committee with some additional information and clarification. So you should be seeing that again. Um, so um, the items that I have for you today are um, uh, just to, uh, oh, it looks like, um, I'm sorry, we've got, I'm, I'm seeing notes from some of our, our uh, staff here. Um, that we need to make sure that we do the uh, vice chair election. So oh. um, I think we, we might have missed that item on the agenda. So um, I, can... I actually, I, I saw it and thought it and ignored it. I should have called. <laughs> that was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so uh, why don't we go ahead and do that? And then we can come back to my report. Okay. So with that, um, are there any nominations for the vice chair? Can I'd I like to go? nominate uh, current vice chair Peterson. Great, thank you. Is there a second? Commissioner Holton second. So that was moved by Commissioner Cisco, seconded by Commissioner Holton. Vice Chair Peterson, do you accept? I do. Great, thank you. So Just with that, he the beard, he can't lose the position. <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> right. Chair, Chair Weeks, we do have a vote afterwards. So. Okay, so um, uh, Mr. Maloney, do you call roll? I do. Okay. So that was moved by Commissioner Cisco, seconded by Commissioner Holton. Thank you. First, Commissioner Carter. Aye. Commissioner Duggan. Aye. Commissioner Holton? Aye. Commissioner Okrepke? Aye. Commissioner Sisko? Yeah, that's why I thought it went out of order because it looked like she had frozen. Okay. Yeah. Vice Chair Peterson? Oh. Aye. <laughs> and Chair Weeks? Aye. Now we can wait for um, Commissioner Cisco to unfreeze. Oh, there she, she oh. was the, the uh, mover. I'm here. I keep freezing up. I'm sorry, but I'm an <laughs> eye. <laughs> okay, thank you. So that passes with uh, seven eyes. Uh, welcome to another year, Vice Chair Peterson. Thank you for being willing to serve. And now back to Ms. Jones. Thank you. Uh, congratulations, Vice Chair Peterson. I uh, look forward to working with you over this next year. Um, so um, yeah, just, just a couple of, of quick things for uh, the commission. Um, the first one being just to let you all know that we do not have any items for your regular 
February 10th planning commission meeting. So that meeting will be canceled. Um, and then uh, two quick reminders for you. Uh, the first is uh, just a friendly reminder. If you have a, either an absence or you need to abstain from an item, um, if you just let us know ahead of time so that we um, can be prepared to make sure that we've got quorum for our items, um, it's very much appreciated. Um, and then uh, another friendly reminder to um, check your city emails um, at least, I would say at least once a week, if not more, um, when we send communications, it is to your city email address. Um, and so uh, usually we're, we're hoping for, you know, somewhat quick responses. So if you could just check those regularly, that would be great. And that is all that I have for tonight. Okay, thank you. Um, so with that, uh, we'll move on to statement of abstentions by commissioners. Commissioner Krepke. Yeah, uh, I'll be abstaining from item 8.1 due to a financial relationship with one of the applicant team. Great, thank you. Uh, and we don't have any consent items tonight, so we'll move on uh, to our scheduled item, which is uh, item 8.1, public hearing, Penstemon Place, 59 lot, small lot subdivision, including a mitigated negative declaration. Hillside Development Permit, Conditional Use Permit, and Tentative Map at 2574, 2842, and 2862 Linwood Avenue, file number PRJ16-032. This is an ex parte disclosure, so um, we'll start with Commissioner Cisco. I visited the site and I have no new information to disclose. Thank you. Commissioner Duggan. I visited the site and have no new information to disclose. Oops. Commissioner Carter, sorry, I went out of, I don't know my alphabet tonight. It's quite all right. <laughs> I, I I also vis visited the site and have nothing further to disclose. Thank you. And Commissioner Holton? I also visited the site yesterday and I have nothing further to disclose. Thank you. And Vice Chair Peterson? I also visited the site and have no uh, additional information to disclose. Thank you. And I also visited the site and have nothing further to disclose. Um, so I believe Ms. Murray is the planner on this. You are correct. Good evening, Chair Weeks and members of the commission. It's a pleasure to be back here in front of you again. Let me share my screen here. Was I successful? Yes, you are. And there we go. So the project before you this evening is Penstemon Place. Um, and the address, 2574, 2842, and 2862, Linwood. Actually, sorry, Susie, um, I don't see the full screen. I don't know if other people are just have a little bit of it cut off or if it's just, oh, that's much better. Okay. Oops, a little, little, oh, a little more to the, whatever, the left. I, <laughs> I don't know if that's, anyway. I've got, it, I've got it on full screen and I don't know okay. how to adjust it if, if it's not in the right place. That, that's okay. Sorry. But go that's ahead. Okay. I'm sorry. Sorry for interrupting. No, no problem. Can, can everybody see it okay though? That's real important. It looks like yes. Okay. Thank you. So the, the project proposes a 59 lot single family residential subdivision. Um, two of the lots would be constructed with accessory dwelling units and four more will be constructed with the option to include accessory dwelling units. The development plan includes six different floor plans, um, six different floor plans uh, made up of both single and two story units. Um, 13 lots uh, will be, we used to, I'm, I'm gonna give a little bit of history here. We used to require during a um, small lot subdivision that applicants provide architecture. This plan has been in for quite a while and initially the applicant did provide all of that information, gave us all the architecture and those plan sets were provided to you as part of your, in, your packet. But the only lots that they're committing to those plans on are those that have some slopes. And I'll talk to you about that a little bit further into the presentation and the reason why. 
So um, there, again, there are 13 lots that will commit to certain architecture. The other 40 sets will have a little bit of flexibility, but um, we don't anticipate a whole lot of deviation from the proposed development plan. Uh, the, pro the project will take have two access points, one off Linwood Avenue, <clears throat> actually three access, access points, two off Linwood, both west and south Linwood and Verbena Drive to the north. So here's the site plan that um, was part is part of the project. As you can see at the top of the screen, that's where v Verbena comes down. Um, Poinsettia Place extends from the west side of the development towards east, towards the Farmer's Lane Extension and Taylor Mountain. And then um, uh, there's a, there'll be a new street introduced off uh, Linwood that will extend into Verbena. These two uh, red symbols um, delineate where the uh, proposed accessory dwelling units will be constructed. And the four uh, symbol or the four other blue symbols show where they will be optional. Making the assumption that none of the four additional ADUs will be built, a total of 62 dwelling units will be constructed. 59 of those will be market rate and represent 2.3% of our, of our five-year goal um, through the end of this year. The other two represent a quarter of the percent for those moderate or second, um, moderately priced or, or second unit uh, households. <clears throat> the project requires a mitigated, mitigated negative declaration. The draft document was circulated back in June of 2020. The required entitlements include a hillside development permit for, to uh, do construct housing on slopes greater than 10%, a conditional use permit for a small lot subdivision, and a tentative map to subdivide the 9.73 acre site into 59 individual lots. Here's an aerial view of the, the site now. There are six homes on the site, and I believe four of them are occupied, and as I understand it, two of them are boarded up. Um, don't quote me on those numbers, but I know that there was a question raised about how the, the, ocu the occupants of those that are occupied will be, um, uh, how they will exit the homes. The people that live in those homes are either related to employees or are employees of the applicants. They are fully aware of, of the project that's underway and they've been in there long enough. So at the very least, at the very least, they'll get a 60 day notice from the, the developer. <clears throat> However, as I said, that 60 day notice, they're fully anticipating it now. <clears throat> so here is um, kind of backing off a little bit, the, the development site again in the surrounding uh, neighborhood. And as you can see, this kind of like fits in, uh, fills in a piece of the puzzle there. Um, the, just to give you some context of the surrounding neighborhood, we have these residential uses all, you know, surrounding to the north, west, and south, and very similar residential development. We also have parks in the neighborhood, and one of the... Um, common comments that we received, I think one of the petition comments that we received was about the Linwood uh, HOA private space areas. Those are private space. They are maintained by the Linwood HOA. And the, but above uh, to the north of the project, the Dowan Hour Park is public. Um, and there's also, of course, beautiful Taylor Mountain off to the, um, off to the east. There was also um, some late correspondence included today from uh, our deputy, deputy director of our parks department. And she outlined several other parks that are currently in the works at some point. There's some are planned, some are not. Um, and I can provide the detail when I have that in front of me, but I don't. And I'm hoping everybody had an opportunity to read that. When we get to the point of public comments, I'm happy to pull that information up. I'm guessing that the applicant may also bring it up in their presentation. So this project has a really long history. It started back in 2016, April, with a neighborhood meeting, and then we received the applications for the project in December. 
back in those days, <laughs> in the olden days, as my former supervisor used to say, um, that uh, we had development advisory meetings. Those were pretty much the equivalent of what we do today with the development, the pre-application meeting with staff, where we would look at the plans and identify, identify issues. Um, and then in June of 2020, as I said before, the initial study and mitigated negative declaration were circulated for a 30-day public review period. So I wanna make two comments right now. And, and first, I wanna thank all of the people who, who called in on those, or, or who reviewed that mitigated negative declaration. The mitigated negative de declaration is better today because of those comments. We corrected the biological section with regard to trees. There were some comments about the um, uh, the number of ADUs, just to clarify the accessory dwelling units, there are two proposed and a possibility of four more being added. The other thing that I'd like to do is I would like to call out to the applicant team and say thank you very much for your patience through this process because they have been extremely patient and and I am I am grateful for that. Um, there were some other events that added to the delays, which I think we all know about, which is the, the Tubbs and Nunn fire, Nunn's firestorm. And the applicant has also been very um, busy himself in helping with the rebuild there. And then of course, the, the response to COVID the COVID-19 pandemic, which is really <clears throat> kind of put a stick in the spokes on you know processing some of these larger projects. So the general plan land use designation is low density residential. And in the image on the left, you can see where the lighter yellow and the kind of almost a, a light sage green color are separated. The lighter yellow in that area, uh, the general plan anticipates uh, development at a density between two and eight units per acre. Um, the, the graphic to the left is the zoning, and this isn't a planned development. Um, it's a plan, it's a very old, uh, the Southeast plan development is a very old um, PD, and um, we'll discuss it a little bit more as we go through, but basically we relate it to the R16 single family residential zoning district. <clears throat> so the project requires the hillside development permit. There are nine required findings which were drafted um, on the, the draft resolution. Draft resolution. Um, just to summarize, they, you know, the site plan minimizes the visual prominence of the hillside development. Site development minimizes alteration of topography and drainage patterns. Site development does not alter slopes greater than 25%, except as allowed by the zoning code. Um, the pro the uh, project grading respects natural features and vi vis visually blends with adjacent properties. Uh, the building pad location, and design avoids large large areas of flat pads. Uh, both project, uh, the proposed project complies with the requirements of, of the Hillside Development Chapter, Zoning Code Chapter 2032. Um, the proposed project is consistent with the general plan and any applicable specific plan. There is no applicable specific plan in this area. And the, establ the establishment, maintenance, or operation of use would not uh, would, under circumstances of the particular use would not be detrimental to the public health, safety, or general wel welfare. Um, and then there's a required uh, finding in the hillside development section that the project be reviewed in compliance with the city's uh, design guidelines. I talked about the policy statement earlier. In the policy statement, it requires this new development in these areas or in this area to go through the design review process. However, subsequently the city has decided that single family residential development does not go through that process. So, the, but, but because the hillside ordinance requires that finding, we have gone through the analysis, although the project is not required to get a design review entitlement. So it will not be going to the design review board. <clears throat> So I talked earlier about the, the homes that are on sloped areas. The graphic here on the right shows you where the slopes, where there's a higher concentration 
of slopes greater than 10% throughout the site. As I mentioned in my staff report, there are several, it's kind of littered with little areas of greater than 10%. That's, um, you know, if you look on a per, per site average or a per lot average, it does, it's not enough to, to require really the, the hillside development permit. I think we see, you know, if you look at a flat land, there's always some sort of little slopes. But the real sloped area is really concentrated up in the northeast corner of this, this site. Those, uh, the black symbols there, those uh, denote the, the 13 parcels where the applicant has chosen it, chosen to lock in the architecture. And in doing so, they won't require another hillside development permit when they go to develop these sites. So the, the four images on the left are the four models that will be distributed intermittently throughout those, those 13 parcels. So I said that we re reviewed the project in compliance with the design guidelines. Here are several goals that the, the project helps implement, including providing an interconnected street network, creating an environment that encourages pedestrian friendly activity, sidewalks, bicycle routes. Um, it, it includes a, a variety of single story and two story, one and two story, homes and some of which also include the ADUs, which um, attract a, a different um, tenant, if you will, um, or occupant, let's say, and it does not um, silhouette above uh, ridge lines. The conditional use permit is another um, required entitlement and, and there are six uh, findings that need to be made for the conditional use permit. <clears throat> and I, I think I've already demonstrated that the project is consistent with the uh, general plan and the zoning. Um, uh, the, the design, location, and operating characteristics that are very compatible with the surrounding neighborhood. It's, as I said, it's, uh, it's surrounded on three sides by very similar development, different architecture, but the same type of development. Um, the density is appropriate for the location. Um, it it's includes the required access, all utilities are available. <clears throat> Granting the permit would not constitute a nuisance or be injurious or detrimental to the public health, interest, safety, convenience, or welfare, or materially injurious to person's property or improvements in the vicinity and zoning district in which the property is located. This area has been designated for a very long time since I've worked for the city for exactly this type of development. So we're just filling in that puzzle piece now. And of course, the project has to be found in compliance with the environmental, California Environmental Quality Act, which I'll touch on later in the presentation as well. So and then the final entitlement is the tentative map. And I think maybe on this, this uh, document, it's a little bit easier to see where the connections of uh, poinsettia run, you know, extend east from, um, you know, the western side of the, the project area, where Verbena drops down from, from the north, and then the new street is added uh, from the south side of Linwood. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the project, the, in, the initial study and in mitigated negative decrement declaration again were circulated back in June of 2020. Because of public comments, and again, I'll say thank you, it's a better document today. We've corrected many errors that were, were um, pointed out to us, but none of those errors created significant edits. They, they didn't change any conditions of approval, anything. So it, it, the, the uh, document was not recirculated the Environmental Quality Act does not require that. Mitigation measures that, that are in um, the, um, the mitigation monitoring and reporting program, which if I slip and call it the MMRP, you all know what I'm talking about. And we have uh, mitigation measures relating to air quality, biological resources, hazard and hazardous waste, noise, transportation and traffic. I did um, see a question in the late correspondence today, and I, I apologize to the person who sent it. This was sent to us, uh, to me, several months ago, and I 
along with probably a couple hundred other emails, um, I, I didn't see this. So, um, but there was a question about the biological resources when the tree, the I'm sorry, when the bird and bat surveys are done, um, will there be postings for that? There will not be postings that I'm aware of, um, but they, they have to provide evidence that these reports were done prior to getting their permits issued. So um, I hope that answers that question if the individual is listening. Um, during, during staff's review, um, there were several issues, hurdles that we had to get over, including uh, tree removal and replacement, stormwater compliance, the site, air, site and area drainage really, and the circulation and area improvements. There are no unresolved issues at this point. So we did receive a lot of public comments and uh, commissioners, I, uh, I apologize for duplicates. Um, we got these public comments towards the beginning of the COVID shutdown and they came to us via email, via courier and via uh, US mail. US mail got scanned by staff that was inside and forwarded. So I, I did my best to eliminate duplicates and I understand that there are still quite a few dif duplicates, but I think you get the gist of it. The, um, the triggering events, again, that the triggering events for a lot of that, that public correspondence was the circulation of the draft um, MND or uh, mitigated negative declaration. But the, the neighborhood meeting that was held back in 2016 was also a really um, well attended and I think a, a good meeting all in all. Um, one of the things that came out of that, at, the, at that meeting, there were um, all two-story units, and um, one of the, uh, the neighbors brought that up. That was an issue, and when the project was sub submitted, it included one and two-story units, so that was great. Um, I, I've touched on the parks already, so to the, um, to the west of, of this project, the Linwood Parks, those are private parks. Those are, there's concern about new residents of this, this um, uh, subdivision using those parks. And I live on a private street. I'm gonna use that analogy. If there's limited parking, if somebody is going out to, to uh, eat and they're going across the street and they park here, I ask that point out that it's private and ask them to move the car. And I think that that's probably the same way that one would handle somebody using the park. You just ask them, tell them it's private property and ask them to go. Um, tree removal, we've talked about tree removal. There will, be, there will be four significant oak trees retained. There will be four more oak trees that they will, the, the developer wants to retain, but given their location, they may not be able to. The tree mitigation includes mitigation for all but four oak trees that will remain we may get, fingers crossed, the four other oak trees as well as additional mitigation for those. They will plant the mitigation trees regardless of whether those additional four are saved or not. Um, grading and drainage, I think uh, I'm, what I'm just gonna say because I am not the engineer that, <laughs> that uh, reviewed this is that um, it has been reviewed in compliance with all our regulations and if you have questions, I'm gonna call on Jesus McKig and the applicant to answer them. Um, I'm gonna give another plug right here for our, our general plan update process that's going on right now. One of the comments that was said to me is the, brought up the fairness or, or not fairness of the development review process, stating that the, the, the project was already approved when it came in. Well. What was approved when the project came in was the land use. And that's, that's designated through the general plan process. We are upgrading the general plan right now. So please, anybody that's out there, please get involved. This is the time to do it. Not when developments are proposed, but when we're doing the general plan update, because that's when we designate land uses. So um, I'm, you can reach out to me. I will share the contact name for the planner that's spearheading that process, Amy Nicholson. If you're familiar with her, she's, she's a champ. So um, please, please get involved now. Yes, did that sound like a plea? We really want you to be involved. So 
Sound barriers for Farmers Lane extension also came up. It is not the burden of this project to provide those sound bar barriers. And if they're required when that project moves forward, they will be installed. Excuse me one sec. Okay. <clears throat> I already addressed the single story and two story homes. Energy efficiency. So by waiting five years, we now have a plan that when these building permits are submitted, they will not be allowed to add any gas appliances. When the initial study was first drafted and when the um, plan was first submitted, that was not the case. But since then, the, the all electric building code has been adopted. These units will, none of them will have gas, any gas fixtures and all of them will have uh, photovoltaic uh, panels. And area circulation, I'm gonna move down here. These, there's a couple things that have come up. <clears throat> the, as part of the, the project, the project, there's a couple of uh, improvements that'll happen uh, at the, where the poinsettia lane is being extended to the west and the Linwood extension, or the, the Linwood Avenue there at the top red arrow there will be a four-way or all-way stop put in that location. And then down um, closer to Aston uh, with, um, for Linwood Avenue, they will be paying their fair share to a road widening project there. Now that area right there that's shown with the, um, red, the lower red arrow um, is relevant to this next slide. So this little highlighted area here, this, there's been a little bit of a, a mix up, is it there or isn't it there? And the general plan is really not clear. The general plan land use diagram available online eliminates that dotted line, which is a conceptual, it says local street, but I think uh, it, it is more of a collector street. And I can, I'm happy, a local street is something that just serves that area. And a collector street is something that serves people from outside the area going through the area and kind of like, a. I'll let Rob and Nancy address that a little bit more if you have questions. But um, so this little this little dotted line conceptual, it's kind of it's it's vanished on some documents and it's still on others. So the hard copy document in the library, it's still there. That's where this this picture was taken. The one up online, it's vanished. So, but the other. Um, thing that we are, are looking at as part of the general plan update is that the, just to the west of this, this possible extension here is that Linwood, um, I'm sorry, Nita, Brookwood, Aston, and Fairground, funky little intersection right there. And, you know, I, I admit it, I mean, it's a challenge sometimes getting through there. And we're, we're looking at the possibility of, of a roundabout there, which actually makes a lot of sense, but all that will be done um, as part of the general plan update that we're currently working on. Oh, and can I just say again, members of the public, please get involved. So <clears throat> that all public noticing for this hearing was done in compliance with, um, with chapter 2066 of the zoning code. Uh, that included a mailed notice to, the, to uh, property owners within 600 feet, I'm sorry, pro property owners and occupants within 600 feet of the site, publication in the Press Democrat, three signs that were posted on the project site. Um, I wanna point out that, you know, that there was some a, a mix up when the signs were posted. They were initially posted on one frontage of Linwood, I believe the west uh, western side of the property, western edge of the property. Um, we heard from several residents. Thank you very much for, for speaking up. Um, and uh, last Friday, I believe, the signs were relocated so that there is one uh, on the southern side of the property side along Linwood Avenue. One was left on the western side and one was added at the dead end street of Verbena at the north end of the, the property. There were also notices posted down at City Hall um, email lists and uh, a virtual notice posted up online. So <clears throat> with that, it is recommended by the Planning and Economic Development Department that the Planning Commission approve the Penstemon Place subdivision by adopting four resolutions. 
a mitigated negative declaration as edited, which will be attached to the, the resolution, a hillside development permit to allow development on slopes greater than 10%, a conditional use permit for a small lot subdivision, and a tentative map to subdivide an approximately 9.73 acre area into 59 residential lots. And that concludes my presentation. And in case there are people calling in and you cannot see this screen, my name again is Susie Murray. My telephone number is 707-543-4348. And my email address is smurray at srcity.org. And that concludes my presentation. And I know that the applicant has one that they would like to share, but I'll wait for your, your go, Chair Weeks. Thank you, Ms. Murray. Uh, any questions of Ms. Murray before we hear from the applicant? Okay, not seeing any, then um, if we could go ahead and um, promote the applicant and we can hear from them. Thank you, Chair. Okay. They, have, they have quite a large team of applicants and they have a list of order that we got in which they'd like to speak. Um, Mike, the, those, the five um, are, are members of the public in the order. The, the ones that I requested the, that they be allowed to speak in order. Those are members of the public. The oh, understandable. Team. Okay. Yeah, We're going to. Um, the team is Kurt Nichols. If you could promote him. And um, I think he's the only one that needs to be promoted at this time. Although, oh, finally it opened. It's a big, it's a big file. <laughs> My computer was hesitating. So Kurt can, as soon as I get this up, Kurt, just go ahead and tell me when to flip it. It's gonna be one moment. We have, uh, we have to do some renaming. So give us uh, maybe like 30 seconds. Sorry about that, you guys. And I just did want to mention um, for the public commenters, I do have that list of the, people of the public who would like to speak in order. So we will go with that. Yeah, that was our confusion. Sorry, Ms. Murray. Um, okay, so I, I think, I'm, I think I'm in, we can hear you. Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure you could hear me. So um, I guess, Susie, you're gonna bring up the presentation on your screen. Whoops, sorry, I brought it up on my screen. Hold on one second. How embarrassing. I'm going to get used to this one of these days, you guys. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me get it in presentation mode. There we go. Okay. Great. Thanks. Um, so we can go to the next slide. So Chair Weeks and Commissioners, uh, appreciate the opportunity to bring this uh, new housing project to you. Um, as uh, Ms. Murray indicated, we've been looking forward to this for a while. Um, I'd like to introduce um, our, uh, our team that's uh, uh, here this evening. So um, others are mainly here for, for, for questions and things should they come up. Uh, but again, I'm Kurt Nichols with Carlisle Macy. Um, and also with me from Carlisle Macy is Brianna Morrison. And also our client, the owner and developer of this project, Aaron Matz. And then uh, not listed on the slide here, but also available is um, our traffic engineer, uh, Daylene Whitlock with uh, WTRANS and our arborist, uh, Becky Duckles. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna try to uh, not duplicate too much that, um, that Ms. Murray went over, um, but just you know, for orientation again, here's uh, the location of the project site. Um, surrounded by uh, existing development and uh, is an infill site um, as was previously indicated. Next slide, please. So what I mainly want to do is walk you through our approach to the design of this project. Um, our goal has been to create a new neighborhood that would fit into the site and the surrounding adjacent neighborhoods and also to seek a balance between preserving significant site features and providing new homes. So we started with a review of the site, existing conditions, opportunities, and constraints. Um, has been previously mentioned, there are six existing homes on the site, um, four of which are currently uh, 
occupied, all of which will be removed prior to construction. Um, the site, as you can see right now, is primarily grassland um, with uh, a number of trees primarily along the, the west and south edges. Um, there are actually 53 trees total on site and one immediately adjacent to the north property line, kind of up near the northwest corner, the upper left of uh, that you can see here, yeah, you can kind of see it there. Um, that's a significant oak tree that is actually on that neighboring property. And um, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, of the, the 53 trees um, and the, the one adjacent, so that would be 54 total, including the offsite one. There are 34 of those are oaks, 16 valley oaks and 18 coast live oaks. Um, also within that count, there are 13 trees um, that have been planted around these existing homes that are actually of species that are exempt from the, the city's tree ordinance. Uh, next slide, please. So as, as part of our initial site review, we kind of synthesized the data that we, that we gather and, and impressions of the site and try to fit that with our goals. So, um, this kind of illustrates some of the main points. We identified the three largest oak trees on the site. There's a 34 and a 30 uh, inch uh, valley oak um, near the upper right uh, in the image here. Uh, so that would be near the northerly property line, kind of on the east side that are real significant. I'm sure you all noticed as you drove by the site, you know, those are very prominent and, and lend a lot of um, you know, a lot of the site's character and, and, and sense of place. Um, there's also another one kind of down more toward in, within the main part of the site toward the south uh, west corner. That would be the lower right on the screen here. And then in addition, there are several others along the, uh, the edge of Linwood Avenue, both um, where Linwood Avenue is along the southerly edge of the site and the easterly edge. Um, it's and some of those aren't unfortunately highlighted on this on this image, but there's there's a number of uh, of trees there, um, and I think as was previously indicated, we've identified four of these um, that we're going to try to save. Um, and again, the the consideration for selecting those had to do with their location in relation to Linwood Avenue and the required um, widening of that street. Um, but as uh, but as well, a consideration for a desire to seek a, ba seek a balance with the layout of the home sites that we're trying to provide, and the grading that will be associated with those, um, which you know the the trees have you know no tolerance for. So there's a number of factors that, that go into that. But um, the the four along the edges that we've identified, um, we think there's a, a a good chance in working. Uh, with our arborists that we can save those. Um, another important consideration to um, the development of this site and the design of it is the fact that the Farmers Lane Extension um, has already an approved design and it joins the site on the east. And I'm not sure if you can see very well on here, but there's a number of kind of fine parallel lines that the arrows it says future farmers lane extension plan calls for extensive grading um, that shows the uh, the grading that's associated with the already approved design of farmers lane. So there's a fair amount of of grading that's already going on there. So, you know, in looking at that, we view that as both uh, an opportunity and a constraint. Um, the constraint of having farmers lane there is the fact that, you know, it would be a future source of noise. Um, however, the opportunity is that the fact that there's already grading going on there gives us the opportunity to place the homes below the elevation of Farmer's Lane, which will do two things. One is that it will drop them out of the, the line of fire of the future noise so that we wouldn't need, uh, there won't be sound walls needed as was um, described in the, in the noise study. And the other thing that it does is to get the homes lower overall so that they're their, uh, uh, the visual profile is, is lowered as well. Uh, next slide, please. So again, this is um, showing the, the proposed plan for the project in the context of the surrounding neighborhood. Um, 
And as was previously mentioned and was um, actually was a goal of ours all along, maybe some of the design guidelines still stick with me, but a goal of our design was to have interconnected streets without dead ends so that they would be walkable and connected to the adjacent neighborhoods. So I think this illustrates that Verbena Drive being extended uh, into the site, um, as well as Poinsettia from the west. In particular, Verbena Drive provides direct access to the Downhower neighborhood park that exists to the north of the site. And from the north property line to that neighborhood park is about 1,100 feet. So it's a little less than a quarter of a mile from there. Um, you know, obviously, if you go from the southern part of the site, it's it's longer. It's about, I think, six or seven hundred feet longer. But anyway, it's it's a very walkable distance. I think if you saw the uh, uh, communication from city's deputy parks director, I think she indicated a, a half mile walking distance is a is a standard they use. Um, let's see. Oh, I want to also just mention something here in the at the beginning of the process we had as we went to the first neighborhood went to the neighborhood meeting, we actually had a different layout um, from the one that that we're bringing before you tonight in that at that in that first one, um, we didn't poinsettia lane didn't extend into the site and instead the kind of the new street a that comes up from Linwood um, goes north and heads over and connects with Verbena, actually went through Verbena and then headed further to the west and intersected with Linwood. And we heard from some folks at that first meeting, um, particularly the ones that had homes uh, on Linwood right across from that, that, um, you know, could we please find another location for that street that was pointed at them? So we took that into consideration and, and, you know, made that change as we, as we went forward. Uh, let's see, next slide, please. Uh, this is just the slope analysis. I, I think Ms. Murray, you know, pretty much went over this, um, the main things to come from this, which is really, you know, determination of, of which sites uh, are considered hillside by virtue of their slope. So in, in this, the, the areas, the yellow area makes up about 80% of the, the site, and those are all areas of slopes less than 10%. The bright green is between 10 and 25, and the little specks of dark green are the, the 25. But um, the affected lots and so forth, I think she already covered. So uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is the development plan that shows the layout of, of homes proposed um, and was, as was previously indicated, we started off with um, kind of different requirements that we conform to, which got into um, a lot of detail about, you know, how the project and actually the homes um, would be laid out and constructed. And, and so this even gets into, you know, what plans and the mix of them. So there were actually six um, homes, uh, each with two different elevations. So that's kind of, that's 12 different looks, if you will, um, that were designed specifically for this project. Um, the ones in blue to the uh, uh, upper left are on auto court lots where they're basically clusters of four that share a common driveway. Um, and this was done uh, primarily to introduce some additional variety into the, the types of residential units that would be um, provided uh, with the project. So these auto court lots, they make up 12 of the, the total 59. Uh, let's see. Oh, the other thing I wanna point out here, unfortunately our graphics are, uh, didn't turn out the way I wanted. There's a section I wanna show you through the site grading on the next slide. Um, and the location of that section, if you can see, looking over at Linwood Avenue, right above where it says Avenue, you can see a line across there, and it's got a little arrow pointing up and an A there. And if you also look over on the Farmer's Lane Extension side, yeah, thank you, Susie. And then over on the Farmer's Lane Extension side, yeah, you can see it there. And then where it crosses Street A, there's kind of an angle point, you know, in that, that line. So that, um, that section is that we're gonna look at in just a second is taken through um, lots uh, seven, eight, 19, 26, 33, and 39. So next slide, please. 
So here's the section, and this is this is to illustrate um, the proposed grading, and in particular, how we would be setting um, the homes, particularly those adjacent to Farmers Lane, below the grade of Farmers Lane. So if you look to the to the very far left on the slide, you can see at the top the elevation of of Farmers Lane um, as per the approved design. The the dashed line that you see. Uh, through here, that's the um, that's the existing grade right now, and then the proposed grade is the the do solid dark line, and then these are the the actual homes that you're, you're just looking at on the development plan, um, to scale with the heights and everything. So it's it's um, giving you a real real view of what that looks like. But that il is to illustrate the intent to 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 drop things down so as to reduce the visual impact and also to eliminate the uh, uh, the potential noise impact from the future farmers lane. Uh, next slide, please. So this is uh, a view into the project looking east uh, from Linwood Avenue. Um, and this particular view is looking at the most southerly of the four unit auto courts. Uh, so that would be, uh, and so what we're looking at here, going from left to right, the house on lot nine, and then you see the homes on lots 11 and 12 uh, next. There, so those are all the auto court lots. And then moving to the right, um, the house that's kind of a brown green in color is on the corner of Poinsettia and Linwood. And then uh, next to that one, the next one, the one-story White House would be on also on the corner of Poinsettia and Linwood. And then just behind that White House would be the lot, or I'm sorry, the the uh, portion of you can see of the home on lot 51 that's on Poinsettia there too. So that's just to uh, to give a sense of you know what the, the streetscape would look like uh, after the project's built. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so here we're looking at the tentative map, um, and this shows across the top the the, the, the typical street sections, um, and you can see there's three of them along Linwood because there's a lot of different things going on with Linwood, um, particularly um, along the, the west side. Some of it's been widened and improved. You can see a, a place in the middle where um, there's a, a, a lot that the previous development uh, kind of worked around. It didn't uh, didn't include, and so the street hasn't been widened there. Um, and in general, I guess what I wanted to point out here was that um, the, the the typical, the city standard for the street um, will have us widen it to 18 feet from the center line, which is kind of the faint uh, long long and short dash line that you see in the, in the middle of the street. So moving over 18 feet out from that, um, would be what the standard is. In order to save those trees that we identified or, or try to save them, again, we're not gonna really know until we get way far down the line and down to the point of, you know, even seeing where the, you know, where the, the roots are and, you know, exactly what we're gonna run into with the grading when we get there and so forth. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's something that, you know, is pretty common when we get into, um, areas that, you know, have not been previously developed and have oak trees. I can give you another example that was done in recent years um, over in uh, northwest Santa Rosa, just south of Cottingtown along Jennings Avenue. Um, it was a very similar situation where there were um, existing oak trees along there. Um, and we did a similar thing. We tried to save the ones that, that we could. Um, there were some that, that um, that we weren't able to save, but I think overall in that case, it, it turned out pretty well and that's what we're hoping for here. Um, but in any case, we'll, um, we, the, the minimum widening is to have a 12 foot travel lane from the center line. So in the areas where we're trying to save the trees, that's what, what we're proposing. And you can see, if you look there kind of by uh, lot three up near the, near the Northwest corner, you can see a uh, the dark line that's the curb line kind of moving out and back. Um, and that's an area where, uh, where one of the four trees are. Also, if you go further south on Linwood down to between lots 52 and 53, there's another area where the curb bulbs out. 
and that's an area where there's um, two more trees. Again, all of these are oaks that we would be trying to save. And then if you follow along on around on Linwood headed uh, east by lot uh, 56, there's another area that bulbs out there um, trying to save a 28-inch coast live oak. Uh, let's see, next, next slide, please. So this is the tentative map sheet that shows the um, the utilities um, and and grading. So it has the storm drainage and sewer water and, and so forth. Um, the one thing I wanted to point out in particular on this one is that so the the tray I mentioned earlier that's um, actually not technically on the site but immediately adjacent to it. So you know virtually you know anything that we do close to it you know would would have an effect on it. So. Um, and that is a, a large um, double trunk coast live oak. It's got a 12 and 18 inch um, trunk and um, pretty significant. So um, during the course of working on the project, we've also modified this area a fair amount. We've had a few meetings with the property owner on site with um, myself and Becky Deckles, the arborist to, um, to review, um, you know, how how what we could do to save the tree um, and best provide for it. Originally, we had retaining walls and drainage and other things that were closer to that tree. Um, we're now we've now pulled all that back ten feet away from that tree and um, the drainage even further. So it's a little hard to see on here. I'm hoping you can see the drip line of that tree is kind of outlined in kind of a squiggly gray line, and you can see the the drainage. Um, structures, you know, are are well outside of that, and the uh, um, the retaining wall that's in that area is is ten feet away from the trunk. So we went over all of that um, so that we could make sure that we would that we would save that that tree and and have kind of the the best conform between this project and the neighboring property as we could come up with. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, the preliminary landscape plan that shows um, both the trees proposed to be planted with the project. It also shows the trees that we're, um, that we're proposing to save. They're in kind of a, uh, a, a darker forest green color. Yeah, thank you, Susie. Um, and if you could, yeah, but that, the, where you, that last one that you pointed at right there, with the arrow, yeah, thank you. That's one of the three that we identified before that we want to save. I, I want to point out that, you know, it wasn't just, you know, let's just, you know, save the tree, but, you know, save it in a way that it would contribute to and be, you know, part of the, you know, the neighborhood going forward. And in, in order to do that, you know, it needs to have, you know, some street frontage and not just be, you know, buried behind a house somewhere, which sometimes happens. Um, and so similarly, the other two near the near the north, uh, yeah, those two right there, as you can see that, you know, again, there's 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 street frontage there. If you remember back to the slope map, that's also an area that's that's sloping. And so, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, we there's there are kind of several considerations there, but the main one in order to save those, we had to make sure that we didn't do any grading around them. So we're keeping everything just as it is right there. The only grading happens, you know, kind of well outside, you know, where they are to either side. You can see the, the lots up above that share a common driveway that will all kind of look out on those. Um, but they also are, you know, clearly visible from the street. And then you can also see the ones around the perimeter highlighted better on this one as, as the existing trees, the, the ones I just mentioned that we're trying to save along the frontage. Um, in addition, uh, to that, this shows the trees that we're proposing to plant. So the the, the bright green ones are the, the primary street tree, which we had originally selected to be uh, similar to the one of the street trees planted in the, the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, but one of the public comments, you know, suggested that, you know, there were a lot of oaks on this site. We're removing a number of them and, and you know, why weren't we planting, you know, more of them instead of the, the non-native ones, which we thought was a legitimate comment. So um, this this has been modified um, to make those valley oaks. And I've been 
again, in consulting with, with, with Becky Duckles, our arborist, um, that, um, that, you know, we believe that is uh, a, a viable solution. I think that another comment that came in later, you know, questioned whether that was viable because the oaks are really big and do they have enough room to grow? Um, the new standard since some of the surrounding um, neighborhoods were built is that the planter area between the sidewalk and the curb here is actually six feet wide. So it's, it's better than what it used to be before. And we believe that's gonna work. So anyway, our proposal is to, um, to make all of those now be oaks. So um, with that, what we're looking at here is planting 71 valley oaks and then the, the darker kind of olive green trees where you can see the branches, those are coast live oaks. And we're proposing 20 of those that would be um, as part of the kind of the front yard landscaping for the, the homes as they got built. Uh, next slide, please. And then this is um, a preliminary um, plan of, you know, what would, you know, the front yard landscaping, you know, might look like, but essentially it's, um, they're all low water use plants, um, some of which are native, but all of which are, are low water use. So um, I believe that uh, concludes my presentation at this point. Oh, can you go to the next slide, um, Susie? We do have um, uh, renderings of um, elevations of, of all the homes if you'd like to, to go through those, but um, uh, just to look at, they're available. So. Um, but other than that, I think that concludes my presentation. So thank you for your attention. Thank you for the opportunity to bring this before you. Thank you, Mr. Nichols. Um, are there any questions of the applicant before we go to the public hearing? Uh, no? Okay. So with that, um, I will go ahead and open the public hearing. Um, if you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please select the raised hand button. If you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Each speaker will have three minutes. A countdown timer will appear for the convenience of, your, of the speaker and viewers. And please make sure to unmute yourself when you are invited to do so. Your microphone will be muted at the end of the countdown. And as I indicated um, before the applicant made their presentation, um, we will, um, members of the public had requested that um, we follow a certain order for their comments. So with that, I will um, ask Kim Roberts, if you could raise your hand so you can be promoted. Good evening, can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. All right, thank you for the opportunity to offer a few comments on the urban forest, the opportunity that this project creates to contribute to the urban forest of Santa Rosa. Um, per the US Department of Forestry, healthy forests are the most efficient, inexpensive and natural system to com combat climate change. Urban forests sequester and store atmospheric carbon, buffer wind, control erosion, provide habitat, decrease drought, you know, reduce the heat island effect by an estimated six to 10 degrees and create more livable, desirable places to live, work and play. I really appreciate the comments about the trees on this project. This project property is fortunate to have a number of large oak trees as it has been described, a third of which are heritage trees per the city's ordinance. While some will be retained, 75% of those heritage trees are slated to be removed. Overall, we'll lose about 90% of, of the total existing oaks on the site. On the face of it, the landscape plan offsets this loss by planting numerous oaks, which suggests a threefold net increase in the number of oak trees. Or, however, the majority of those oaks do look like they're proposed to be planted in the, quote, hell strips, um, the narrow planting strip between the sidewalk and the street. And even if that is six feet, I mean, that seems a little small for a, a valley oak as an example, which can grow up to 70 feet high and wide with a trunk girth that can be several feet. That is if the tree survives. Key to the health of any plant is right plant, right place, and the trees may not survive in these narrow hell strips. This plan also proposes including two moderate water use species, maple and a ginkgo, which will require increasing care as the climate warms. 
The City of Santa Rosa Sustainability Team is collaborating with UC Master Gardeners on a climate forward tree project, which will update their recommended city street tree list to only include trees that are likely to withstand drought in the warming climate. There are much better choices for this project, frankly. Trees in our urban forests are really critically important, and I would just request that the Commission consider how to retain more of the current trees, as well as require a landscape plan that focuses on sustainability and advances Santa Rosa's urban forest. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and next we have Chris Roberts. There we go. Thank you. I'd like to speak on uh, uh, the, the fire mitigation issues for this uh, site. The Pensamon Place initial MM MND states the site is designated as a non-fire hazard according to a CAL FIRE 2008 study. However, according to the Sonoma County Wildfire Risk Index, which is a more recent study from 2021, the um, Pensamon Place is in a level three out of five wildfire risk index. Uh, this is a moderate level. Um, for reference, this is the same level as a large portion of Fountain Grove and higher than Coffee Park. In the same study, the properties just to the east of Pensamon Place are rated even higher on the wildfire risk index. Additionally, the, um, a term, the average ember load for the Penstemon Place is in the moderate category, and the eastern areas um, adjacent are even higher levels. The Penstemon Place project is on the edge of the wildland urban interface, and given the prevailing easterly winds during the, the previous catastrophic fires, is in the direct path of future wildfire. Another risk not mentioned is that the Penstemon Place is uh, a possible source of wildfire ignition. Winds from the west can carry flame from unsupervised children, inattentive adults, and illegal fireworks, which we've all seemed to have observed, I'm sorry, observed. <laughs> Finally, the statement is made that the site development will not interfere with any adopted emergency response or evacuation plan and will have no impacts related to emergency response impairment. This statement is incorrect as related to the evacuation plan. There isn't an evacuation plan. According to the Santa Rosa City website, there are evacuation zones, and the plan is to deal with it as the situation, deal with the situation as it occurs. The Penstemon Place project is slated for 65 residences, at an average of two cars per residence, that is 130 cars, given bumper to bumper traffic and the average length of cars, this works out about a, to about a half a mile of cars. I think we all have memories of the evacuations with their associated traffic problems from the recent past. Pensamon Place is in the Southeast two evacuation zone and given the wildfires coming from an easterly direction, there would be an additional half mile of cars that will be in the will be the last in line, and this half mile of cars could impair emergency response to the area. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Um, the next person, if they would raise their hand, is Renata Breath. And then after that is Judy Kalbfell and then Steve Osborne, if you could please raise your hands. Thank you, Chair Weeks. Um, we don't appear to see a run out of breath. Okay. And then J Judy Kalbfell, I'm probably yes. not pronouncing your name right, sorry. Judy was just on and she seems to have disappeared. Yeah. yeah I saw her there for a moment, but she's oh, She's down. She's okay, down. great. So um, Judy Kalbfell, thank you. Um, my concern is pedestrian safety on Linwood. There's always been a problem at the blind corner where Honeysuckle joins Linwood and there'll be more traffic with the extra houses, the new houses coming in. 
So what I would like is a marked pedestrian crossing with a flashing orange lights that pedestrians can activate before crossing the street. The speed limit could also be lowered at that corner as well. There's a lot of foot traffic on Linwood because of the nice parks we have in the neighborhood. And there's not a safe place to cross because there's no sidewalks on the opposite side of Linwood. So I think uh, lights, flashing lights would be a big help to people who walk there. And also where Brookwood comes into Linwood is a bit of a problem because a lot of the people on Brookwood think we're gonna be turning on Brookwood and they pull out in front of us, a roundabout instead. But um, I'm still voting for the Brookwood to be connected. So that's all, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, next uh, is Steve Osborne. I think he had his hand raised a minute ago. Uh, hello, I, I'm here with uh, my wife, Renata Bress, who was, you asked to comment earlier. So if I could defer to her and then I, I'll make my presentation after that. All right. Thank you for letting me comment. Um, we are uh, in the neighborhood um, of the Pensimon place. And of course we have been aware of the development or the future development for almost 25 years. And uh, about 25 years ago, even more, we were um, told that at the, as, as the development comes closer to the county line where there is a minimum of uh, 1.5 to 5 acres per house, um, the development would not be as dense as it now occurs uh, because uh, the development says that the um, uh, density is about two to eight units per acre. Well, there's only one larger um, unit in that development, and that happens to be right there where the beautiful two trees are that would so make like an ideal uh, little park for uh, park for the uh, neighborhood and yeah, we're, so we're in 8.1. So. somebody talking while my wife is presenting i'm sorry mr maloney could you mute yourself please thank you thank you could she have her time back please Sorry about that, Chair Weeks. So I was saying that <clears throat> the density uh, is not what we were told uh, years ago at the close to the border of the county line. And if you look at the map, you can see that on all three sides, actually on all four sides, the density is lower, even in the high density areas is uh, lower than Pensamon Place itself. The two heritage trees would make a great neighborhood uh, pocket park. You wouldn't have to have anything other than a few benches there. And people could, with a stroller, go there and not having to walk <coughs> uh, half a mile from the end all the way to uh, the Dauenhauer Park. Um, it's a suggestion, but the density is definitely higher than uh, all the surrounding areas, and especially close to our neighborhood, which is the rural residential density. Thank you. Thank you. Um, once the timer is reset, Mr. Osborne, you can go. Okay, thank you. Thank you, this is Steve Osborne. Um, the staff report on Pensman Place includes uh, 300 pages of public comments. About 100 of those comments say that more trees should be preserved. Another 100 say that the traffic needs more study and the final hundred are about parks, fire, and other concerns. 
Despite these hundreds of pages of comments, the staff report devotes less than two pages to responses, and many of those responses don't even address the writer's concerns. For example, the staff's response to the 100 comments about tree preservations consists of only three sentences, quote, the draft MND misstated that 16 heritage oak trees would be removed. As shown in the final version of the MND, that number has been increased to 20 heritage oaks. Tree mitigation was calculated in compliance with city code chapter 17-24. In other words, the staff response to the public outcry about preserving trees is to proclaim that the number of heritage to be removed has actually increased. There's not a single word about tree preservation. The public comments included many ideas for preserving oak trees, but I would like staff to respond to just one of those ideas at this meeting. <clears throat> that idea is to preserve 10 oak trees along the edge of the property and six oak trees that would be in the yards of the new houses. I gave staff all the details of this idea in writing more than a year and a half ago. As to the hundred comments about traffic, it seems clear that a new traffic study, which includes the Brookwood extension, will answer many of the questions that were raised. As staff is well aware, the Southeast Area Plan of 1994 included the Brookwood extension, which would connect the northern and southern ends of Brookwood and would eliminate the traffic bottleneck at Linwood and Aston. The expansion appears in both the 2020 and 25, 2035 general plans, but it somehow wasn't considered in the planning for Pensman Place, which would be directly affected by the extension. Now is the time to correct that oversight by conducting a new traffic study. Now is also the time for staff and developers to respond to the hundreds of public comments by modifying Pensman Place to make it more environmentally sound, more feasible in terms of traffic, and more sensitive to the needs of the local community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Osborne. Is there anybody else who would like to make a public comment at this time on this item? Thank you, Chair Weeks. No one else is raising their hand at this time, but I do want to remind any callers, if you press star nine, they will raise your hand for it. Thank you. Don't see anyone else. So with that, uh, we'll go ahead and bring it back to the commission. Chair Weeks, if you can officially close the public hearing. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yes, I now officially close the public hearing. Thank you for the reminder um so we'll bring it back um and uh if we could uh maybe address some of the questions that um, were raised by the uh public so um i so uh, i'm not sure who would which of the team would answer some of these questions um and, and please, uh, fellow commissioners, um, interrupt me if um, there are other questions. Uh, I, so we'll go ahead and there was a question on um, fire mitigation and level three wildfire risk index and how that had changed. I, I'm gonna ask Paul Lowenthal if you're available, if you could chime in, please, Mr. Lowenthal, and talk about that, the, the fire concerns. First of all, uh, I would like to congratulate Mr. Lowenthal. Aren't you, didn't you recently become our new fire marshal? I did, thank you, Chairman Weeks. Sure. Um, yes, yeah, so thank you for the question. Um, it is a good question, and actually that's one of the other meetings that I'm sitting on tonight is uh, actually the fifth community meeting for the county uh, CWPP. And there is a little bit of uh, confusion that is being raised because of the difference between the county's community wildfire protection plan and the city's community wildfire protection plan. So we are aware of the ratings and the GIS components that have been released uh, through the county's plan. Uh, the city actually did mapping through the development of our plan, and we're working right now to address potentially some of the discrepancies. 
Uh, our, our evaluation was very specific to the city um, and the area immediately around it, whereas the counties was a little bit more global. And I'm not and working. We are working to figure out how accurate it is um, regarding the different classifications. So again, we are aware of the, the counties. And in fact, that is still under draft form uh, and is getting public comment and public feedback. Uh, the cities, we've looked at two different uh, ways of rating it right now, both through our risk assessment map uh, and our wildfire hazard rating map. So for that area, um, it does fall in areas that we identify as both low and moderate uh, for the actual wildfire risk. And then for the hazard rating map, that's actually based on flame length. Uh, it is primarily also uh, low and moderate. And the reason it has kind of that lower end of the spectrum is because of the fuels uh, in that specific topography. It's mostly oak and grass woodlands on the hill, whereas other areas in our community uh, to our north uh, and northeast part of Santa Rosa are a different type of fuel and at a much greater risk to our community for what we refer to as that north northeast wind event that we've typically experienced now uh, several times, uh, more notably since 2017. So really, the greatest risk to Santa Rosa uh, uh, from our uh, work that we've done is really fires, large scale fires that develop from our north uh, to northeast. Uh, that's not to say there isn't some level of risk throughout our community. Um, we've seen fires uh, throughout Santa Rosa uh, in both our densely uh, and uh, more uh, rural settings of Santa Rosa. Uh, but a lot has changed to work to mitigate those risks. Uh, and some of those uh, questions kind of came up and some of the comments that came out regarding evacuations, how we respond to emergencies, and really the difference in how our department uh, is reacting to uh, development, uh, both in and around our, uh, our wildland urban interface. It is uh, to note that this area is actually not included in what we refer to as our, our WUI or our wildland urban interface but we were still respond and treat it just like uh, it would have been. Um, from an evacuation standpoint, uh, we have changed how we respond to fires. Uh, when uh, there's comments about whether or not we have an evacuation plan, uh, we have changed how we plan for evacuations and how we implement them. And we have come a long way from where we were in 2017 uh, to where we are today. Um, those plans were utilized during the glass fire uh, much differently than they were in 17. Uh, we have changed how we monitor fires, how we respond to fires, and how we implement our plans to actively uh, effectively evacuate uh, our populations. In an area like that, um, it is more susceptible to a fire uh, developing uh, in the Bennett Valley Road or Holland Heights area and then potentially pushing uh, down into that community. That's a much different risk uh, than we would experience in our, in our wildland urban interface that has more room to grow um, and per, would uh, constitute more of a threat to our community. Our typical uh, winds in Santa Rosa, probably 95% of the season are actually out of the West. So really the the threat of of a fire um, in that specific area is actually more likely to occur from the home spreading into the wildland. Linwood is obviously a concern of ours um, because of the traffic it's had uh, with a lot of the undeveloped areas. So in a roundabout way, actually developing along Linwood actually mitigates some of that roadside threat. Um, and then we've become uh, more concerned about the actual weed abatement efforts that would need to take place on the backside of that development to the east, which would then provide for a buffer zone from any grass fire that does develop to the east and would spread to the west. And as you know, I can talk a lot, so feel free to ask any other questions and happy to jump in. Thank you. Um, and while we have our fire marshal here, do you, does anybody else have questions for him? Okay, thank you. Uh, sorry, another question had to do with uh, marked pedestrian crossing, and if that was- Sherry, yeah. Mr. Duggan had a question. Mr. Duggan. Oh, I'm, yeah. oh. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. She came in late, but she wants to ask something. <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, this is for the fire marshal. Just if the draft plan uh, does come back in that, that area, uh, that we're talking about, Penstemon Place, does um, it does end up being rated at a higher risk 
as the neighbors say, the county is in the draft plan. It's, it's, it's a higher risk than the city um, has classified it currently. Uh, would that change anything about the, the um, development plan as far as the materials used or the codes they, they go by or anything like that? You muted? It would not. Okay. All right, thank you. Correct. Yeah, no, and we we are, like I said, we not to minimize the plan by any means. I've been very involved in it, uh, but I've run some different tests around our community and have found some anomalies on how their data uh, is spilling over into well into the city and some of the hazards. So that is part of some of my follow up and some of my comments that I'll be making on behalf of the city back to uh, the developer of the actual countywide plan just to make sure that that information is good and solid. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Lowenthal? Okay. So then uh, the question, question I, there was a question on marked pedestrian crossing and if that was possible. I'm not sure who that would be for. I think actually that may be something that we may want um, the traffic engineer. The, yep. with Rob, is, engineer. Rob is on right now. Oh, okay. All right. Good evening, Commissioner. Um, so yeah, we evaluate crosswalks all the time in, at the City of Santa Rosa and our Traffic Engineering Division. So um, this would be nothing out of the ordinary for us to go out and evaluate. Uh, it wouldn't be necessarily uh, related directly to this project, but if it's an existing condition that needs to be evaluated, we're, we're absolutely happy to do that. And if uh, and if they the current neighbors wanted that, they would reach out to you or to somebody in TPW and request that? Yeah, they absolutely would. But I, I wrote down the comments, so we I will put it in our log to go out and, and evaluate. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see. There was questions around the trees. Um, let, me, let me go ahead and ask other commissioners to to ask uh, if they have any questions that they heard in the public comments portion that they would like to see addressed. Commissioner Carter. Yeah, if Mr. Sparkle is, Sprinkle is still available, um, I'm curious as to uh, what the status of the Linwood widening is. I know this project has been dinged for 14% of it. Where, what is the total cost and how far are we into that? And the secondary question would be um, either the roundabout at Aston Linwood or the extension of uh, Brookwood, the connection of Brookwood, are those, is it necessary for those to be taken up in the general plan update to for them to become projects? Or what's the status of either of those projects? It sounds like they're not planned at any detailed level. Correct. So they currently aren't planned as part of this project is that it was identified that Linwood does need to be um, improved and widened to help facilitate a level of service of um, better than F for that northbound approach at Linwood and um, Aston. Uh, the Brookwood extension was in the journal plan. Uh, and then as, as Susie mentioned, it has been dropped out and would need to be um, put back into the general plan. Well, actually, I don't think it's ever left the general plan. I just think it was left off of the map. Um, but what we would like to do is evaluate both that and the roundabout um, in conjunction with the um, with a farmer's lane extension being uh, added. Because really, really the, the traffic issues related in this area, uh, in my opinion, are related to the lack of farmer's lane extension being um, implemented at this time. The, all the neighborhood traffic and traffic that's going across town and using Brookwood as a, a cut through is not the ultimate design of what Brookwood is intended to be. Brookwood's intended to basically serve that neighborhood and disperse the traffic within those neighborhood out to the other arterial streets. And right now it's it's acting more as a, um, a cut through in addition to doing that function because Farmers Lane Extension has not been constructed at this point. So we need to look at this holistically. I believe this traffic study looked at the worst case scenario at this intersection with this traffic added, what is it gonna look like in the future if nothing else was constructed? And we would need to add that, that right turn pocket to help facilitate that traffic. 
So definitely as part of this general plan, we, we need to make sure we're looking at this this holistically. Um, and and that, that may or may not necessitate any um, further modifications at this intersection. Okay. And just a, a follow up is is the uh, who is who would be the sponsor of the farmers lane extension project? Is it the city project? The city of Santa Rosa. Oh. In conjunction with actually in conjunction with I believe that there are SETA uh, measure M funds available also for that project. Yeah, this, this is me. I'm uh, Rob's colleague. So the funding for Farmers Lane Extension, it has a very long history. It's uh, one of our measure M projects. And, you know, it's it, it's been a, a project that we're, we're trying to build, but um, it, it's falling way short of the available funds through measure M. So. Really, it's a, it's a project that our city council, I think, really needs to weigh in on um, in terms of the prioritization for um, moving forward with that project. And it is a city project. Thank you. Um, are there other questions uh, from the public comments or to be addressed by staff at this time? before we enter a resolution for further discussion. Uh, Chair Weeks, could you um, return to the issue of the tree preservation and uh, potential landscape uh, changes for sustainability of trees? Sure. I think we, we, need, we didn't get that one done yet. No, thank you. Um, so that was, um, there was a preservation of the tree issue and the preservation issue um, that Mr. Osborne mentioned. Could somebody uh, in the applicant team or staff talk about that? I, this is Susie, and I, I'm actually going to ask Kurt Nichols to respond to that because I think that he can explain better why some of those trees are maybe survivors and maybe not. And, and but outside the ones that are proposed to be saved. So. Thank you. Mind. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm not exactly, well, let me give it a try. I'm not exactly sure how to respond because I think there are a lot of opinions expressed that I don't necessarily agree with, but but um, on the factual side, I think the statement was made that a number of the trees um, that are that the uh, commenters would like to have uh, re remain, that they are located in areas that could be easily saved because they're not where houses are and, um, you know, they would be in yard areas and, and so forth. And believe me, if that was the case, you know, we would we would preserve them. I'll preserve every tree I can you know, along with, you know, what else we're trying to do. The reality is that there's grading associated with that. You know, if we go back to the, you know, the, the section that I showed you, you know, I kind of focused on what we were cutting, you know, how we were cutting the area down, you know, by farmer's lane, you know, where there are no trees. But the other part I didn't really focus on that might bear looking at is, as you get, you know, closer to Linwood, there's actually a low area there that is getting filled um, as, as part of that. Um, and so it's not just a matter of, you know, placing the homes on the existing terrain um, to make all the, the grading and utilities and, you know, everything work. There's, there's grading involved in that. And that affects the ability to, to save all the, you know, to save all the trees. So, um, you know, I, 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 yeah, I'm not sure if there's more specifics that Commissioners would like to get into. I'm happy to. I'm just. I'm. I'm. I'm afraid. I'm in a, a bit of a loss as to how to take that on. Totally. I. I. I'm back on, and I'd also like to chime in a little bit. Um, the project is. A lot of times we see residential development. We see development in general in conflict with tree removal, and and we do have these conflicts right now. We need housing, and we love trees. Um, the. The, the project has been found in compliance with the tree ordinance and actually exceeds the required mitigation because they're mitigating for trees that they they may very well save. So, um, I mean, at the very least, we are with, I mean, we've mitigated the ones that will be removed. 
Um, and in the worst case scenario, um, we've, we've mitigated for the ones that are removed. In a best case scenario, we'll save some and still uh, get those additional trees in. As, as far as the, the varietals of trees that are gonna be planted, that, that is something that the, the final landscape plan will come in. The, the number of trees won't change, the varietal may. There's a certain amount of, of valley oak trees, and I, I think it was close live oak, that are required pursuant to our, our tree uh, ordinance, but, but there may be some changes in the other, other trees if they're determined to be more appropriate for those locations. So I think it depends not just what's in that sidewalk area, but what's to the side of the sidewalk area as well, where those roots can establish themselves and, and work their, their, their way to. Um, but we have people that are qualified to review those plans when each individual house comes in. And then of course the street trees uh, with the improvement plans, so. Great. Th thank you, Ms. Murray uh, and Mr. Nichols. Are there qu other questions? Um, that I missed from the public comments, um, Commissioner Cisco. Um, it, it might just be helpful uh, for Renata's benefit to have uh, Ms. Murray go over again um, how the density is set in the general plan, how that evolves over time. And, uh, and then I do have a question of uh, Mr. Nichols when we get that done. Thank you. Yeah, so. Um, yeah, so the, the general plan land use diagram does, designates what, um, what types of land uses will go where. And with residential, this in this area, it's low density residential. And, and the low density, it, it allows residential development anywhere, anywhere between two and eight units per acre. Now that doesn't mean that we have to clone what's, what's next door. We just have to get our residential densities within that that figure. And this project is developing within between two and six units per acre. Um, I'm happy to do the calculation if I can look away from the screen for a moment. But, and I also really wanna point out too, that accessory dwelling units do not count towards density. Um, and that's something they, they haven't, they, they don't now, they haven't since I've been here. I don't think they ever have. And I don't see them considering the housing crisis in the state of California. I don't see that changing anytime in the near future. But um, yeah, so. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Cisco, do you wanna ask Mr. Nichols the question now? Uh, yeah, that would be great. Um, Mr. Nichols, good to hear you, if not see you. And um, my question is, we don't often get a chance to, to comment on uh, design and architecture, but what I noticed was that um, there are all plan ones in a row on Linwood and your streetscape kind of was below that where it showed one of the plan ones and then the rest. Can you um, kind of help me understand how you're gonna have a more um, varied streetscape with, with those plans all being exactly the same so that we don't end up with a monotonous streetscape uh, along Linwood as, as it starts there? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, I might preface the whole thing by saying kind of my understanding of the, the requirements now is that when we started this, you know, we needed to, to get into that level of design and we did. And I think as Ms. Murray indicated, we don't actually now. However, I think that, um, you know, I think, you know, the the applicant has, you know, demonstrated that, um, you know, he really, you know, wants to do a, a good project here. And so even starting out, getting all the architecture, you know, design, which personally, I think, you know, these are, are nice. With respect to the individual plans, while they're all the same plan, um, each one has, um, has two different elevations. So it's not exactly the same one. Um, and they're a little bit different. And I don't know, Susie might be able to bring those back up, but there's a, there's a plan A and, you know, and, and B. So at least there would be two different ones. I mean, if that was, um, you know, a, an issue, I suppose there could be a modification of that. That, that, you know, that kind of the, the unit that faces Linwood is, you know, is, is, you know, the floor plan of it at any rate is, is designed specifically for that location such that, you know, it has a wraparound we can get to, we yeah, have plan one, I think we're looking for, 
which let's see. Um, we um, we only have plan four, five, and six. Oh, Susie, in your presentation, didn't you have plan one there somewhere? Well, or we could go to the, or we could actually go to the, uh, um, to the streetscape that we were talking about that that shows shows a couple of plan ones there. But I guess what I was trying to point out is that the floor the. Uh, the, the plan one plan is designed specifically to front Linwood with a wraparound front porch um, that you can see there and also to have the garage tucked behind, you know, in the in the back there. So I think I think that's an important consideration to how it's going to look. And then there's also, um, you know, as it is right now, they have at least, you know, two elevations, um, perhaps, a, you know, a, a third elevation on the same plan could, could help that. But I think that, um, you know, Personally, I think that it has has merit to keep the wraparound front porch and the garage is tucked back as as is done in that plan. I hope that, that's, that's helpful. just helpful to understand that you have different um, variations of elevations. It just wasn't clear in the in the presentation. So thank you for that. You bet. Um, are there other questions before I, I ask somebody to enter the first resolution for discussion? Okay, so not seeing anybody. Uh, would somebody like to enter the first resolution, which is the mitigated negative declaration and MMRP? Okay, uh, Vice Chair Peterson. Uh, I'd like to move the resolution of the Planning Commission of the City of Santa Rosa adopting a mitigated negative declaration and mitigation monitoring and reporting program for the Penstemon Place subdivision at 2574, 2842, and 2862 Linwood Avenue, assessor's parcel numbers 044-200-027, 044-200-029, and 044-200-040. File number PRJ16-032 and wait for the reading. Thank you. Uh, is there a second? Uh, Commissioner Carter. Um, and I think uh, what we could do is um, talk about the project as a whole and then um, read each resolution uh, into the record if that is all right with the with uh, Mr. Burke. Um, so with that, um, we'll start with uh, Commissioner Carter. And, and as you um, talk about the project, don't forget to um, make the required findings at that point. So. Um. Well, we're considering all the resolutions, even though one's read into the record. I, I, I'm yes. generally in support of the project and believe I can make all of the necessary findings. Um, I think the uh, MNND did, in fact, benefit from public circulation, and we've had heard from the, the uh, resource agencies that are going to be involved in that program. And... Um, I can support staff's recommendations uh, relative to the the MNND and the, the process that we followed there. Um, I don't, I'm not gonna address each and every one of the findings. I think the findings for the use permit are, are apparent and, and fairly easy to make. And I don't see any discrepancies with this, with the tentative map and the city's design guidelines and requirements and zoning. Um, therefore, I'm most I'm generally in support of the project and the, the various resolutions uh, that were are before us. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Cisco. I'm also in support of uh, the project and uh, find the MND MMRP adequate <laughs> and can make um, all the findings for the the uh, subsequent resolutions. Um, 
I think like what Ms. Murray indicated, this is a project that, that fills in a puzzle piece of that area of, uh, of the Southeast. Uh, it's, it's adding important infrastructure. Uh, so um, I think it's in keeping with the neighborhood. I think it'll, it'll finish the neighborhood off nice. It's nice to see um, a development occurring where there's actually already a park. <laughs> so I'm happy about that. And um, also was pleased to see in the uh, the DAC report, the, uh, the policy that there will be uh, signs and phone numbers for the neighbors to contact the, the contractors directly with any kind of construction questions or issues. So I appreciate that being included in the DAC. And with that, um, I'm, in, I'm for the project. Thank you. Commissioner Duggan. Um, I'm also in support of the project. I can make all the required findings for the um, mitigation, the mitigated negative declaration and MMRP, uh, the hillside development uh, permit uh, findings, the conditional use permit findings and the tentative map. And I think Commissioner Cisco said everything I was gonna say, so I won't repeat it, but I'm in support of the project. Thank you. Commissioner Holton. And that's why I love going after the two of you because you guys always pretty much say exactly what I'm gonna say. So I'm gonna keep this as concise as possible because my mobile hotspot is actually about to die. Um, so I'd like to get my uh, two cents in. So I'm also in approval of this mitigated ne negative declaration in the MMRP. Um, I'd also like to say too, that the discrepancy in number of trees uh, or the uncertainty of the number of trees. You uh, just, uh, we lost your audio. Oh, sorry about that. I'll, I'll just basically say this. Some of these things we're gonna have to just wait and see. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Vice Chair Peterson. Um, I'll also uh, echo my fellow commissioners here. I can make all of the required findings uh, for the mitigated negative declaration, the hillside development permit, the conditional use permit, and the tentative map. Um, I do want to take a moment. I mean, as uh, Commissioner Cisco said, the and it was in the presentation. You know, getting the public feedback made the report better. Um, I think we've gotten some very thoughtful uh, feedback from the public tonight. Um, the concerns that were raised were addressed, I think, uh, particularly about about fire, um, you know, the the perpetual farmer's lane extension, you know, I guess, fingers crossed that 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 project keeps moving along and the money is there at some point to to do that because I think it is a, a key to addressing the issues um, that the public raise. So, I, I, you know, I, this is, some of this stuff is a little outside the scope of land use, uh, so not really in our purview, but I do, um, I, I get the sense from the, the developer and, and from what we heard from Ms. Murray that um, the, they're willing to listen to feedback. And I, I think as the issues with trees and drought tolerance and, and all that sort of thing moves along that, um, you know, they're able to work productively with uh, the neighbors as, as any issues may arise. So um, with that, I, again, I'm in favor of the project and I can make all the required findings. Thank you. And um, first of all, I'd like to give a um, shout out to Ms. Murray and her shout out to the general plan um, process and how important that is. Um, so hopefully people will be in, get involved with that. Um, I also can make all the required findings on the four different resolutions. Um, I think um, I, I do also want to appreciate the public feedback both that was uh, during the whole process and tonight um, also. Uh, and I think, um, well, that, that, that's all I'll say on that. So uh, with that, uh, Mr. Maloney, um, it was the resolution, the first resolution was uh, entered by, Commissioner, by Vice Chair Peterson and seconded by Commissioner Carter. Will you call roll? Or Call yes. for the vote, rather. Thank you, Chair Weeks. Commissioner Carter? Aye. Commissioner Cisco. Aye. 
Commissioner Duggan? Aye. Commissioner Holden? Aye. Vice Chair Peterson? Aye. Chair Weeks? Aye. So that passes with uh, six ayes, uh, Commissioner Krepke abstaining. And so we have the second resolution, uh, which is for the Hillside Development Permit. Uh, would somebody like to, uh, Vice Chair Peterson? Uh, I'd like to move the resolution of the Planning Commission of the City of Santa Rosa approving a Hillside Development Permit for the Penstemon Place subdivision which will allow development on slopes greater than 10% and secure architecture for lots 27, 29, 31 through 38, 41 and 55 at 2574, 2842 and 2862 Linwood Avenue, file number PRJ16-032 and wait for the reading. Thank you. Is there a second? Uh, Commissioner Holton, second. Uh, any other comments on this? Okay, not seeing any. Um, that was moved by uh, Vice Chair Peterson and seconded by Commissioner Holton. Mr. Maloney, you call for the vote. Commissioner Carter? Aye. Commissioner Cisco? Aye. Commissioner Duggan? Aye. Commissioner Holton? Aye. Vice Chair Peterson? Aye. Was that, was that an aye? Sorry. Yes, that was an aye. Okay. Just want to make sure. Chair Weeks? Aye. So that passes with six ayes, Commissioner Krepke abstaining, and we have, we'll go to our third resolution, which is the CUP. Um, Vice Chair Peterson? Why, why stop a good thing? I know. Um, resolution, I'd like to move resolution of the Planning Commission of the City of Santa Rosa making findings and determinations and approving a conditional use permit for Pensamon Place, a small lot subdivision at 2574, 2842, and 2862 Linwood Avenue, file number PRJ16-032 and waive further reading. Thank you. Uh, second? Commissioner Carter. So that was moved by Vice Chair Peterson and seconded by Commissioner Carter. Uh, Mr. Maloney. Thank you, Commissioner Carter. Aye. Commissioner Sisko. Aye. Commissioner Duggan. Aye. Commissioner Holden. Aye. Vice Chair Peterson. Aye. Chair Weeks. Aye. So that passes with six ayes, Commissioner Krepke abstaining, and the fourth resolution tentative map, uh, Vice Chair Peterson. I'd like to move resolution of the Planning Commission of the City of Santa Rosa approving the Penstemon Place tentative map at 2574, 2842, and 2862 Linwood Avenue, file number PRJ16 dash zero three two and waive further reading. Thank you. Is there a second? Commissioner Holton. Thank you. Uh, so that was moved by Vice Chair Peterson, seconded by uh, Commissioner Holton. Mr. Maloney. Commissioner Carter. Aye. Commissioner Cisco. Aye. Commissioner Duggan? Aye. Commissioner Holton? Aye. Vice Chair Peterson? Aye. And Chair Weeks? Aye. So that passes with uh, six ayes, Commissioner Krepke abstaining. And with that, unless um, Ms. Jones has anything else for us, I think that ends okay. So with that, uh, we'll see you all sometime in February, hopefully. So thank you all. Good night. Apologies all for the camera. Thank you. No. <laughs>